as the vernal equinox approaches next week and the azaleas continue to bloom across campus, we gather here to celebrate the ideas that have blossomed into books. But what makes a good book? The type of book that parades through your mind like Mardi Gras or sticks to your bones like a hearty bowl of gumbo. The type of book that can linger with you for a length of time as wide as Lake Pontchartrain and as long as the mighty Mississippi. Behind every good book is a person, an author. They toil and write and grind and rewrite. They carve a subject down into its necessary state and serve it up for a willing audience to devour, like a beignet from Café du Mans. Authors shape the culture around them, around all of us. They lead armies into battle and speak out against the unjust. They spark imagination that drives a lifetime of curiosity. They shine a light on corruption and evil and take down titans of industry. They advise presidents or run the most prestigious universities on the planet. They teach us our history and what we can learn from it. They predict the future. They make people dance or laugh or cry or all of the above. Authors make people feel seen and human. They make people full. And without authors, a book would just be ink and paper without structure and setting, without all the spirit that brings us here together at this moment in time. At its inception in 1857, one of the most storied publications came into being when a group of abolitionists founded The Atlantic to illuminate the American idea. They intended the publication to be fearless and outspoken at the dawn of a new era of human civilization. Now, 167 years later, in partnership with the New Orleans Book Festival, The Atlantic joins us here on opening night, nestled in the oak trees of Tulane's uptown campus to welcome us into their exciting journey towards choosing the greatest novels of the past 100 years and explore the profound impact these books have had on society and culture. This is the 2024 New Orleans Book Festival. Mardi Gras for the mind. Please welcome to the stage our co-chair and executive director, Cheryl Landrieu. Good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here tonight to welcome each and every one of you to the 2024 New Orleans Book Festival at Tulane University. I'm so happy to be joined by our co-chair, Walter Isaacson, who's a great partner and friend. Walter and I have a common vision to bring authors together, to share reading and big ideas, and that's what we've been able to do for the past several years here at Tulane. But as you know, it's a Herculean effort, and it comes with a lot of help. Our staff and all our BookFest staff, I just want to give a shout out to, and all the volunteers that help us. Our our uh, host, Tulane University, who's been spectacular despite the growth that we've experienced over the past several years, so we're very grateful to them. Uh, I'd want to give a shout out to our 2024 honorary co-chairperson, Mrs. Gail Benson, and to all of our supporters who have helped this keep the mission of this festival, which is to be open and accessible. To keep the festival free and open is so important to us, and so we want to thank all the sponsors who help us do that. So 2024 has brought new things, including a partnership with New Orleans Entrepreneurship Week, who is doing cross-programming with us. We have also developed a wonderful partnership with The Atlantic. You know, our authors tell stories, and at The Atlantic, they tell journalism stories. So we have a lot in common, and we learned that through this. And so we're really going to enjoy having them involved in this festival. I want to take, introduce you to Candace Montgomery, who is the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Atlantic Live, who is curating this program tonight, and she'll tell you more about it. So thank you very much for being here, and have a great time this weekend. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. As Cheryl said, I'm Candace Montgomery, Executive Vice President of Atlantic Live. And I lead a team that brings the Atlantic's journalism to life virtually and across stages all over the country. We are thrilled to be the national media partner for the third annual New Orleans Book Festival at Tulane University. 
The Atlantic was founded in 1857, among other things, to illuminate the American idea, continuously challenge assumptions, and help readers make sense of the most consequential issues of our time. Today, The Atlantic launched one of our most ambitious projects, establishing the great American novels published in the last 100 years. This list, which you received upon arrival, has been a Herculean effort from The Atlantic's newsroom and contributors from across the literary landscape. It is more than a collection of novels, but a profound exploration of the American idea through the lens of literature. You can scan the QR code on the back of the handout you receive to read more details about the 136 novels featured in the list on theatlantic.com. And while you're there, you can also support our journalism by subscribing to The Atlantic. And if you are already a subscriber, we thank you. Let me see a show of hands of all of our subscribers. I love it. Tonight's program will celebrate these great American novels and explore the power and relevance of literary fiction, intellectual freedom, and free expression at a time when those liberties are even more precarious worldwide. Thank you to our gracious hosts and festival co-chairs, Cheryl Landrew and Walter Isaacson for inviting The Atlantic to open the New Orleans Book Festival at Tulane University. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you very much, Jeff. And Jeff, I feel, is a true partner here. About some previous century, you and I decided we'd start the Aspen Ideas Festival, and it was a great partnership that we did. 1857. Yes, right, the year the Atlantic was started. There was no Aspen then. It was, it was yes, exactly. Uh, but ever since then, working with him as a partner has been a dream, and that's why I was so glad when Cheryl enlisted him to be part of BookFest. Jeff is one of those people with the Atlantic. He helps set the agenda. But for me personally, Jeff is my compass and agenda setter. Sometimes you ask a friend, what do you think about this? But with Jeff, I always say, what do I think about this? Because he tells me what I think. So I really appreciate 30, 40 years of friendship. And thank you, Jeff. It's make me sound like a cult leader, but that's fine. We'll yeah. go with it. That's fine. <laughs> they think of you that way, too, at yeah. the Atlantic. Oh, exactly. Uh, this is pretty amazing, the great American novels. Uh, we magazine editors know the trick of doing lists. But lists can be very uh, important, especially when it's a list of great books. Because the books tell us a lot about their time. But then when we make a list of them, it tells us more about our time. We're reflecting our time on the past. Why did you end up making this list, and to what extent is it different than a list that would have been made 20 or 40 years ago? The, um, I mean, the impetus for making the list was to generate as many angry emails to me as possible. <laughs> that was the main, my delightful, editors uh, <laughs> decided to, no, it's really interesting how people can get so exercised. Um, you do have one Tulane professor on your list, Jasmine Ward, for which thank you. Who will be Who'll joining be here. us, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is very exciting. The, uh, I mean, the imp so there's a couple of reasons to do this. One is to stir conversation, and I really believe, especially because this is digitally presented, uh, I really believe that it's the beginning of a conversation with our readers about what they th I'm not. I'm not saying that just to sort of cover my whatever. I, I'm also saying it to cover my whatever, <laughs> but it's the beginning of a, a conversation to, to sort of it, it refine and illuminate what we think is most important. But what wait, the, what but, is the conversation? In other words, deciding... Well, no, no, what I mean is that the list is a lie. I mean, to me, you know, the, the novels that mean the most to me, books that mean the most to me live in my head, but I mean, actively live. You know, you're in a, um, I've always felt, um, I've always felt that I'm in a kind of a conversation with Herman Melville in my head. <laughs> I don't think Herman Melville thinks he's in a conversation with me, but, but I feel like, you know, I can read Moby Dick um, repeatedly and find things in it that, that help me understand something about the, the world. Um, 
so, so Lee Shore, about what? why we're all, the chapter on the Lee Shore and the <laughs> yeah, ropes, yeah, yeah. why we're all The importance of investing tugged. in whale oil. The, um, I, so, so, so the list should be as alive as the books, which means that um, the editors of the list, and you'll meet them soon, uh, you know, I think understand this to be the beginning of a, of a, of a process, and we're going to add to this, obviously, as we go on. You know, the, the obvious answer to your question, what would be different, well, apart from the fact that, that literature has diversified in every way possible, over the last 20 or 40, especially if we go back 40 years, um, the the people who are involved in making the list, and we had a lot of editors and writers, and we had novelists from outside the Atlantic also sort of pitch in, and you'll see if you go on the website, theatlantic.com, um, you'll you'll see wonderful write-ups, short write-ups about why these, mm -hmm. these books are nominated to be on this list. Um, uh, you, you know, the it's obviously going to be more deliberately diverse than anything that would happen 20 or 40 years ago even by the let's say let's say that you know you just simply because of what is out there now as well um, but there's also an effort to reach back into history and look at some books that may have been forgotten right. or marginalized or however you want yeah, to I mean I did it. notice uh, it does start off with the largely the canon of great white men in fact, the only email I sent you that was angry was The Great Gatsby, which is your first one. That's the worst book ever written. <laughs> only people who send their kids to Princeton think it's, I mean, just a whole lot of oh, brilliant yeah. sentences is is? in a boring book. Princeton. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Def I won't make you defend Gatsby. I want to change the subject to something okay. agreeable, but like then the list goes, abortion or, you know, or abortion The policy. list goes on, and you almost see a break. It's a what, wonderful what, book, Gatsby, by the way. Sentence to sentence. Every sentence is good, and it's a collection of really that's good the, sentences. That's the Gatsby American and an community inert, out there. lifeless novel. Okay, you should fine. have just done this fine. sentences fine. separately. No, 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 fine, but this is what we want. I mean, I don't personally want all these emails, but we want, generally speaking... You didn't answer mine. We, 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 don't generally, we generally want this to be argued about. It's the beginning, like I said, it's the beginning of a discussion. But I also uh, pick a Fitzgerald in that because it's almost the ultimate of the white male novel of white male angst or whatever. And then at a certain point in the list, it truly diversifies. Right. And that's, I assume, partly because more writers for more well it's 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 a reflection of reality mm -hmm. b it's a reflection of an understanding and i think this has been throughout the history of the atlantic an understanding that has been a progressive understanding that um that america is more than this group or that group this is you know and, and obviously you know when you have a finite number of of mm -hmm. books to include on a list, it becomes a difficult process. And you don't want to throw out things simply because it's not mm -hmm. current, you know, it's not in the current thinking. Um, yeah, you but, proved that by keeping Gatsby But on. But you yeah. want, you're really going to perseverate, aren't you? Yeah, no, it's great. Um, At least you have Absalom, it, Absalom. It, for yeah, no, there's a lot of Faulkner on the list. <laughs> there is a lot of Faulkner. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the point is, is that um, the Atlantic, I, and I, I believe this sincerely, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail, but um, the Atlantic has always tried to uh, extend the idea of what an American writer is and could be. And so we had, I mean, put, a, put aside on the nonfiction side, you know, Du Bois writing 110 years ago, some of the most radical. Frederick people, Douglass you know, wrote well, for you. Well, Frederick Douglass being probably the most famous or important contributor of the early years uh, of the Atlantic, and probably the most important contributor ever <clears throat> to the Atlantic. Um, you, you know, we, we, we've always tried to, um, I mean, there's a writer, she's not on this list, I don't think, I haven't memorized it yet, um, Zitka Lassa, who was a Native American writer 100 years ago, who was incredibly radical, um, wrote very radical pieces for the Atlantic, and, you know, we have been, we, we're big enough and America is big enough to take in everything, you know, and it's not about, it's not a, it's not a zero sum proposition making a list like this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we can just add 
add to the list. And I, I you know, with the, the idea, and you saw a little bit of that in that opening, you know, the idea of the Atlantic from the founder's perspective, and I'm talking about the, probably the most important, among others, the most important novelist in the history of the United States, Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, along with Emerson and maybe the most important poet, Longfellow and all these others. Um, the idea was to have a magazine, have a place where you could refine and illuminate the American idea. And the interesting thing to me about that, if you look, and it's on our site, I believe, um, at the founding manifesto of the Atlantic, they talk about the Atlantic being a conveyor for the American idea, but the founders of the Atlantic, who include Herman Melville and Hawthorne, um, they don't define what the American idea is. And I've always taken that to mean that it's up to every generation of Atlantic editors and writers to figure out what the American idea is. And this is a, this is a very nice expression, a very, very, a very potent expression of... Well, early on, they helped define it with the abolitionists, including, as you said, right. Frederick Douglass. And in some ways, you did that again recently. You resurrected both the abolition movement, reconstruction and all, to talk about it in an issue. Tell me why the Atlantic had that as part of the initial mission and why you go back to it. Right. There were two missions to the founding of the Atlantic. One was the explication of the American idea. And to be, to also to be a home, this was, this was a time in America, 1857, mid-1850s, where good literature was considered British, English literature, and this is a group of people in Boston who are like, no, 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 we're just going to feature, um, we're just going to feature American writers whenever we can. And it was radical in the day when when they brought in, they published a short story by William Dean Howells. It was a big deal because he was from Ohio, you know, and and they made we have a writer from Ohio, yeah. which is like, you know, uh, you, you know, and, and and so the definition of what is. Marginal has expanded gradually. <laughs> um, so, uh, so there was that. And then, of course, there, these are all abolitionists. Um, uh, and one of the interesting tensions in the history and, the, and, and making the Atlantic is there are some principles that are inviolate, and there are, and, but they're, they, they, they are, those compete with the principle that we should be a big tent and that you can't illuminate and refine the American idea if you don't have a bunch of competing ideas battling it out on our pages or today on our website as well. And that gets uh, hard to do today. Yeah, it's very hard to do in America that, that seeks, that, that, that almost willfully, perversely seeks polarization or performative polarization. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you, you know, when, when we were starting in journalism, we did not ever confront this um, idea called platforming uh, where people, people yell at you for publishing a piece that they don't like. Um, and, you know, to me, uh, as uh, someone who's not quite young anymore, I'm just having a hard time with that. Um, <laughs> to me, you know, the idea, when you don't like a piece, write another piece. Mm -hmm. Publish something else, right? right? And, 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 so, and so it is hard in the, in the, in the current moment um, to sort of accept the idea that we're gonna we're gonna fight it out even within side a, a, you know a big tent of a, of an individual magazine. Of course, there's always a great Orwell quote for that, and I think you used it recently. I'm gonna read it, which is to write in plain, vigorous language. One has to think fearlessly, and if one thinks fearlessly, one cannot be politically orthodox. And that is a signature of the current Atlantic. It tends to surprise me. You talk about platforming, deplatforming. Uh, the, I can't remember his name, the g guy who was the op-ed page editor of the New York Times who did the Tom Cotton. James Bennett. No, no, not James, um, Adam Rubenstein. Oh yeah, he just And did. so he wrote a piece for the Atlantic that kind of went against the prevailing orthodoxies uh, do you do that? I mean, are you trying to push the envelope back that way? Yeah, Explain I mean, some people you. think we're trying too hard. Some people think we're trying not hard enough. Um, my, my view of journalists and journalism generally is that, and I tell this to young journalists, it's like, you are not, um, you're not a real journalist when you piss off your enemies. You're a real journalist when you piss off your friends, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you know when 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 you say something that's inconvenient for someone else in your in your orbit, um, and so um, 
you know, a certain amount of scratchiness is, is, is useful. I mean, I, I'm not, um, it was James Bennett who, who said this, that the Atlantic is uh, less of a warm bath than a, than, a, than a very, very hot cup of coffee, you know, and it's supposed to alert and stimulate and also annoy and anger, you know, and if you're not, you know, one of the things, and you used to run a magazine, so you know this, um, you know this sort of issue, one of the things I tell people that we're about to hire or considering hiring is that you have to understand and you have to, it's almost like sitting in the emergency exit row when they have to like yeah. hear a yes yeah. from yeah. you. Yeah. You know what this is, this is an emergency exit row. Yeah. I always say to them, you know, if you work here, you're going to disagree with your colleagues. Like it's, it's axiomatically true. It's impossible for you to agree with everything that we publish. And for editors, copy editors, fact checkers and the like, it, it's especially hard, right? Because they have to make, they have to make something better that they don't actually agree with. And so I, I tell people that, like that's part of the bargain in coming here, you know, is that, is that you're not yeah, going to agree with Yeah, and you have a pretty wide aperture. I mean, I remember you've done everybody from ta Coates, but even George Packer, who was doing a pushback on some of the progressivism happening in his neighborhood. How wide is that aperture and what is off limits? Um, so, what's Actually, off limits? You'll make a go. list of no, things no, that are I'd off limits. No, no, probably unless I go there. <laughs> no, 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 but I, what I can say is that, um, what I can say is that, uh, you know, when people, people will pitch a story to me or one of my editors, um, and we will reject it because it, it's out of bounds in some manner or form, um, and, um, uh, they will say, Inevitably, you say it's a big tent, and I respond by saying tents have flaps. Yeah. The whole point is that you know, you, a, a tent it does end. Mm -hmm. You try to, you try to, and so you know, uh, apart from the sort of obvious categories of things that we would never consciously try to to do, misogyny, racism, so you know, and, and so on. You know, and I'll and I'll get into trouble here by saying this, but that's fine. Um, you you. The, one of the questions that I frequently get is, will you run pro-Trump pieces? And the answer is, yes, I would run pro-Trump pieces. The issue for every article that comes into our system is that it has to go through fact-checking, <laughs> right? Right? No, no, and I, and I'm, If I knew that would get applause, I would use that line more often. <laughs> right. uh, it, 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 so it has to, it has to you, know, you have to have a, a set of facts that undergird what you can't just have a feeling, right? It's not, we're not, we're not very vibey. You know, it's like we want, we, want some, we want some facts, right? And so if you can make the argument, and we have run this, and this is one of the ways you keep from becoming just a part of the quote unquote resistance. We've run pieces that, and I've told all of our editors, like, and this is obviously more, more true when Trump was actually in the White House, is that if he does something that our writers or some writer feels is legitimately good, right, a good policy, and, and you could prove that and make, a, make the case, then we'll publish it, right? And, and I, you know, I, I think it happened. <laughs> I mean, I can't remember exactly. No, I'm, I'm trying to be not snarky here and, 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 and say, like, like if... Yeah. If that happened, and, and you know, then we would. Then but we you would talk do. about whether or not you're part of the resistance, by which I assume you mean the resistance to Trumpism yeah. uh, taking over American democracy. You did a special issue that was just called a warning or something. It, yeah. I, I don't think that was the name. Right. And it, Trump wins. Yeah. Yeah. It was if about Trump. if Trump wins. Uh, you know, it's a warning issue. It was a couple of months ago. I and guess. it's probably what one of only a few times in your hundred and some odd year history that there's a whole issue dedicated to that. Well, we once did an entire issue devoted to pasta, but that was in a quieter <laughs> age. I'm not even kidding, by the way. Well, that's it, I got I always, I mean, the problem with Jeff's humor is I gotta say, okay, is he kidding me? No, 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 we had a cover called Ken, pasta. we gotta get that issue. It was yeah. called pasta. <laughs> um, it was good. It was interesting. Probably sold well. People yeah. like pasta. What are you going to do? Really? <laughs> right. It's it's for many people. It's a more pleasant subject than Trump. Yeah. Uh, you know. To me, pasta is a case the, of the Gatsby. Uh, it's not that tasty. The um, is that OCD? Is that what you call it? Is this what you, you come back to Gatsby over and over again? 
I see a list of 100 and it starts with the great Gatsby. I say, only uphill from here. <laughs> but go ahead, I'm sorry. And don't get diverted by pasta. I'd rather get yeah, yeah. diverted by General Milley yeah. and the issue of... Um, so the, 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 the Trump issue was um, simply... So I have to take one half step back and say that we are devoted to being a nonpartisan magazine, which means one of the reasons you can't be in the resistance if you are the Atlantic is we don't adhere to a party, right? Uh, uh, the, the, the founders in 1857 said of no party or clique, right? Um, so can't, can't be a, a party. So our objection to Trumpism is not that it's Republicanism. In fact, we run, I think, some of the most interesting conservative pieces uh, in, uh, in publishing, in, in, in magazines and newspapers. Uh, and we have, as you know, um, and readers of The Atlantic know, we have quite a few people um, who uh, I identify as conservative and have worked in Republican administrations even in past lives. Um, so it's not about party. Um, Trump uh, falls in a different category for me. The Atlantic is not pro-Republican or pro-Democrat. It is, however, stands for democracy, transparency, rule of law, um, free press, civil liberties, and, and, and so on. And so Donald Trump, obviously, not a secret to a lot of people here, um, has placed himself on the opposite side of some of the things that we've assumed were just generally agreed upon in the way this country is governed. But, but it's not just Trump. Democracy seems fragile at the moment, and it's not because of Trump, it's because a lot of people who are supporting Trump and Trump, like people who no longer believe, it seems to me, in the basic tenets you talked about of democracy. I mean, how threatened do you think democracy is? Very threatened. How threatened do you think democracy is? I think America has a gyroscope and it would right itself, but I've thought that for about five or six years, and I worry this is an inflection point. Well, here's the thing, to add on to what you're saying, 250-year-old project, it's been going pretty well, bad bumps along the way. Yeah, we've Civil had war. worse than the current bumps. Yeah. The Civil War being the most obvious example. Um, which led to something ultimately better in the end of uh, the end of slavery, obviously, mm -hmm. but it was a terrible period leading up to it, and and we've had terrible things happen all along the way. But you know, basically, it's the you know, it's there's there's a, a comforting idea that we make a lot of mistakes, we fall back, then we go forward, and this the story of America is the story of expansion of rights. The story of America ultimately is the refinement. Uh, of, of ideals that lead us to the more perfect union that the founders envisioned, right? Um, I, I believe that, like you, I believe in the gyroscope theory, mm -hmm. but I also, I was just writing something before for the next issue, and um, you, you know, and I wrote the line, Donald Trump, who is currently out on bail, yeah. right, <laughs> is the presumptive Republican nominee. And so one of the Geniuses of humans is that we can normalize to anything, regularize to anything, and one of our greatest shortcomings is that we can get used to anything. Right. And so, w things that happen today, I remember I covered the Obama White House, I covered President Obama, and I remember once it was a two-day scandal because he wore a tan suit, you know? <laughs> um, and once he like reached over the sneeze guard at a salad bar, you know? And it was like, oh my God, he doesn't, you know? And, 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 why has this happened? Why? Have we normalized behavior? Well, there's a lot of self-interest in normalizing it, obviously. And you know, you, you raise a question that I don't have the answer to. I don't know if anybody has the answer to. Without Trump, would we be here? Or did we need Trump? You know, it's the great leader theory, or was there a, was there a broad movement toward a kind of um, American-style authoritarianism that you know, we just didn't sense, but was always there? and Trump just rode a wave. I happen to be in the latter camp, and I happen to see that it's happening around the globe, which means it's not just Trump. And, you know, we can talk, and you're an expert on this, you know, we could talk all day about the role of technology and social media, um, and the lowering of 
uh, gatekeeping and the small d democratization of information, including bad information, I mean factually untrue information uh, in, in all of this. I don't know why it's happening. I think people have uh, huge levels of anxiety um, about technological change, uh, about changes within families, changes within mores. Um, I think a lot of it is a reaction to um, having the first black president and a lot of people in America going, whoa, whoa, wait a second, what just happened? And that's where we are. And you know, we've been toggling back. I still think that's a, a, like, some of what we're having is a hangover from that. I mean, there are a million reasons why we're here. You know, but you here. talk about the role of gatekeeping press and you say a word that's near and dear to my heart, very old fashioned, which is fact checking, uh, which very few publications actually do these days. I, Every now and then when I write for The Atlantic, I get annoyed because I have to go through the fact-checking process. But what is... But, you know, but like colonoscopies, it's good for you. <laughs> Which is why I write for you but, once but every unlike, 10 years. Unlike colonoscopies, we don't have anesthesia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, let's get that image out of our mind <laughs> and go back... Let's talk about the great ...to the gasp. role of the press. I always hate that phrase. Mm -hmm. But in a polarized time like this, it's not quite your mission, but could it be, all right, we're going to be a unifier. We're going to try to end the partisanship. We're going to try to bridge this huge divide. Is that something that we need some in the press to do as a goal? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I feel comfortable as a citizen saying, Yes, I would like Americans to spend more time thinking about what they have in common with their neighbors, and even more practically, how their happiness and success mm -hmm. and stability is tied to that of their neighbors as a way of making people understand that we're in this together. There is going to be, there's no, there's, there's no, there's no civil war coming in which this state is going to go that way and that state's going to go this way. We're all, we're all in the same boat, right? And so as a citizen, I would like people to spend more time thinking about what, what joins us together. As a journalist, you know, it's, I, I always find it, and this is, where, this is where this age is so difficult for journalists generally, because, you know, we're comfortable reporting and telling stories and this governor said that, and this senator said this, and this is what happened over there. You know, and, and, and when you start overindulging almost on what your mission is, I think that's where you can get into trouble because you lose the primacy of fact, right? You begin to think that my, my goal is even higher than presenting people with a bunch of facts. And I think you can then become just another player in whatever polarizing drama is going on. You talk about the role of social media technology and the fact that in some ways, magazines in the past were more unifiers simply because they had to get a broad audience, whether it's Time Magazine or The Atlantic. Uh, but uh, digital media rewards the passionate niche audience and it rewards the algorithm that says, I've enraged people, so I've engaged them. What is the role of uh, sort of social media and others in this pulling us apart? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, and, and you know this a lot better than I do, but I always, well, not always, when I started really thinking about Facebook and the mm -hmm. undergirding stated assumption of Mark Zuckerberg, right, that more instantaneous communication among all humans is a good thing Right. right, right. It turns out that it's not a a good thing. I'm more in like the the James Madison camp of maybe a daily newspaper is too much information for people. <laughs> right. You know. Um, and and you know our and and I'm always quoting this now because I think it's the sort of the best description of our predicament. Um, there's an E.O. Wilson quote uh, uh, talking about the central challenge of of our age of of this age, um, and he goes and he holds that. Um, the challenge is that um, we as a species have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And so when you marry you know, the, the technology to the, to the lizard brain, um, and you don't have institutions in between that can actually yeah, make- Intermediate. Yeah, 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 to, 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 to slow it down, 
if nothing else, just slow people's thinking down. You know, we have a big, we have a, a, a big challenge. So um, I don't think that we would have Trump without, well, certainly without reality TV and certainly without social media. You know, in the other course things. I teach here, which you were a guest at once on the digital revolution, uh, one theme is that digital technology is essentially decentralizing, empowering the nodes as opposed to having centralized power. And uh, that's what happened both with the web, which is where anybody could publish or get any information anywhere, and certainly then with social media. And even now with AI, it's, there's no gatekeeper, but there's also no just centralized, these are the facts, there's no Walter Cronkite. Uh, are we inevitably on a train that's going to make everybody a journalist and no facts more uh, true than other facts? I think it's, yeah, the, the pessimist in me says yes. The, the analytically, it might be too early to say, I hate to use the sort of journalistic mm -hmm. cop out of remains to be seen or it's too early to say, but we're just beginning the you know baby steps in this, in this new universe mm -hmm. and maybe we'll, um, maybe we'll have a rebound effect where people realize that um, a shared reality with a certain set of immutable undergirding facts is better for you and your family than, than the alternative. You know, I used to feel um, this gatekeeper issue is, is one that a lot of people in the quote unquote mainstream media used to feel guilty about. Like, you know, oh, the reason the web is so great and social media is so great is because uh, we're disempowering the gatekeepers. You're the ones who keep information from the people. And you know, gatekeeping may, is another word for editing, <laughs> right? And choosing stories that are better than other stories to tell, right? And I, I don't feel guilty about that term gatekeeping anymore. You know, the reason people still read serious newspapers, serious magazines, is because someone at those places is doing the work of disaggregating reality from fantasy, right? And that's, and that's important. But, you know, I, look, The Atlantic is, is in great shape. We have a lot of readers. We have a lot of great writers. Um, but are we as powerful as a platform as TikTok? I mean, of course not. Is anybody mm -hmm. as powerful as TikTok? You know, of course not. Mm -hmm. And when you have a generation of, of teenagers and, and young people getting their information from, learning from, you know, TikTok University, it's like, it's, it's I don't know if we can, I, I don't know if we're gonna head back. Although one, one countervailing example is it's perhaps somewhat surprising if I'd asked you 15 years ago, you know, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, Deadspin, all these new things have come along uh, how soon will they totally put the old mainstream out of business? If you look at the most successful digital businesses, it's the Atlantic, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post. Well, this is the, this is the happy part. The happy part for me um, is that, yeah, it's a little bit of a tortoise and a hare sort of thing. Like to, when I became editor eight years ago, mm -hmm. I was told that the threat was Vox, Vice, Buzzfeed, Mike, Gawker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera you can name. Mm -hmm. 15 brands, um, they, were not, they were not the threat because we're doing something different. And, and, and I say this with, you know, I, with requisite and true humility, when, when I say we aim to make the highest quality stories possible, we often fail and we often don't succeed, but we're trying to make highest quality journalism. Uh, as the New Yorker is, as the Wall Street Journal is, as the Economist is, and so on. And, uh, you know, our entire business plan, our entire plan for survival and flourishing is the assumption that there's a large group of humans who still want quality stories that are related to reality in some kind of sophisticated way. So far, so good. So that is the countervailing, you know, it's just that, it's just, you know, there's 170 million Americans on, on TikTok, and, you know, The Atlantic does not yet have 170 million subscribers. <laughs> We're just 169 million. <laughs> We're almost there, but we're not quite there yet. You know, other than pieces you've published, the most important piece I think The Atlantic has ever published 
uh, was, it was Reconstruction by Frederick Douglass, is that right? And you're going back to that now. I mean, you're going back to that topic, because it seems yeah, to Yeah, we just did, and you'll, you'll, you'll see some writers uh, over the course of this mm -hmm. uh, great festival who contributed to that. That was just a kind of a, um, you know, if you can have a magazine length subtweet of of reaction, of reactionary forces, that was kind of... In other words, you're sort of subtly pointing at what's happening It wasn't so day. subtle. I mean, we put yeah. Frederick Douglass on the cover, yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> um, and, and you'll hear from uh, the great Clint Smith soon, um, hometown hero and Atlantic staff writer, um, you know, who has written a lot on, on, on this subject and on memory and how we, how we how we choose to, to think about the things that have happened in our, in our history. And you know, the truth is Reconstruction um, was never allowed to finish, uh, obviously. Um, we and, have uh, Drew Faust here who is talking uh, more about Reconstruction and its lack of finishing. Uh, Drew, is, um, Drew is, um, in addition to being um, the greatest title she's ever had as Atlantic contributing writer, but she was also president of Harvard University for a while. Um, both good titles. Some days. Some days, actually. <laughs> I would go with the contributing writer right now. <laughs> the, um, but yeah, and, and, and she of course has written on this for, for that issue and others. Um, and, and so, you know, the thought was obvious. Um, Founded by abolitionists, mm -hmm. and the work of the abolitionist is not quite over, or the work that started in that period is not quite over in America. Then we need to revisit this and revisit it again until. Um, but you know, this is this is fundamentally a very optimistic thing. Correct. Like like you know the idea, and this is something I believe deep 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 in my heart that the genius of America is that the goal. The, our common goal is to make a more perfect union. We'll never get to perfection because it's a human endeavor, but the only way you can get to mm -hmm. something approaching perfection is to actually talk honestly about the imperfections. And one quick question which follows from that, which is, I guess the greatest piece of lyrics you've ever published was the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And maybe- Not personally. I, no, not no, personally. no, no, you were. <laughs> Uh, when was that? 18... 1862, or I guess maybe January 1863. It was. Yeah, Julia okay. Ward Howe. And one of the really cool things you did is you met our local hometown hero, John Baptiste, and you made a musical director of the Atlantic. And he did what you all have to go find online. It's on Spotify. Spotify and a, a rendition of the Battle Hymn of the Republic for the Atlantic, in which yeah. you're in the video. Yeah. I, uh, but in some ways, I mean, that's, I don't mean that just as a joke about John Baptiste. No. It is part of that, what you're doing, which is a battle hymn yeah. of the Republic. Two, two facts about that and then something about John very quickly. The uh, <clears throat> battle hymn of the Republic um, was not called that. Originally, the, she titled it, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, and the editor at the time of The Atlantic, James T. Fields, did the greatest thing an editor of The Atlantic has ever done before or after. He said, you know what, I, we should give it a, like something bigger. Like maybe let's call it the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And she was like, I don't know. And is it, trust me, yeah. you know, it'll go viral. You yeah, know? Exactly. Get, we're gonna, it'll yeah. be on Spotify we're, someday. We're gonna, we're gonna reach all the way to Ohio with this, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, and and the, other, the other point of fact was that she got paid four bucks for, for writing it. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, which you know, probably would be 550 if, <laughs> if you were a, a guy at the time. Um, John was amazing, you know, we both know John, everybody here knows John, and uh, I got to see John B, just a total genius. We went into a studio and he spent a half hour manipulating the, the strings of a piano and putting in cards in his wallet and, and he's just doing, and I was like, what are you doing? He says, I got this. And, and he played the most, and you find it on Spotify. It is the most gorgeous. I think you can get it on YouTube, too, because YouTube you can video. see yeah. you in the video. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and you could just hear this beautiful L.A.J. haunting version of the battle hymn. And he is one of the true geniuses of New Orleans, as are you, no, no. despite your <laughs> terrible feelings about Great Gatsby. Well, speaking of which, the green light at the end of the dock has flickered off. So let's say goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.